All right, whenever you guys are ready. All right, thank you all for coming today. We are so excited to have folks here for the ATAR Quantum Working Group. Um, this event will be uh, recorded um, and uh, we're excited to have Simon Hartley uh, join us today for our Quantum Speaker Series. Uh, Simon is the US Sales and Business Development uh, for Cambridge Quantum. Uh, it is a uh, continuum which unites Cambridge Quantum software with Honeywell's Quantum Solutions. So we're really excited to have Simon come and talk to us about the foundations of zero trust architecture and the key for hardening verified quantum physics. So with that, I will turn it over to Simon. All right, thank you, Alison. Um, yeah, so one of the things I want to do is highlight how quantum quantum technology can be of a benefit to an organization today. So that's that's what I'm looking to explain. How uh, kind of fundamental technology like key hardening uh, from quantum physics, from verifiable quantum physics, is the underpinning of zero trust architecture, which is a, a very big theme uh, across the federal government and enterprise in general. Uh, so uh, as Alison mentioned, uh, Continuum with a new combination of Cambridge software from the UK and Honeywell's quantum hardware from the US. Uh, something I'd really like to emphasize is that uh, Cambridge software, um, one of our key ideas is that we're, we're hardware independent. So we, we're looking to do software that doesn't have a, a direct uh, reliance to the underlying hardware. So before I kind of plunge into the specifics of today's talk, I, I just want to address the kind of wider space or the wider things that uh, Continuum is trying to do. If you think about it, um, the promise of, of, of quantum is a new way to solve difficult problems. And you can see some of the R&D areas that we're involved with, things like chemistry, algorithms, machine learning, and so on, that have the potential to do things more quickly, more accurately, potentially more scalability. Uh, the threat is uh, adversaries can turn that against us. If you've got things uh, like determin uh, determin uh, sorry, deterministic algorithms that generate keys or you know, uh, encryption schemes that can be kind of reversed, if you will, that's the threat side. So what I'm talking about today is really just the application of, of quantum technology to defend against threats. So... Today's topic is zero trust architecture, and there are many pillars to that. And from a technology perspective, I've just got like a bunch of bricks here. Uh, some of the components in today's digital experiences that depend on keys and certificates, everything from certificates authorities to firewalls to VPNs uh, to PKI infrastructures, 5G, internet of everything. Uh, as many of, you, many of you will know, uh, the foundational technology is encryption algorithms. And um, we've, we've heard on previous calls some of the great work uh, that NIST is doing there. The focus of Cambridge slash Continuum is key generation and more specifically verifiable random numbers. So that might seem a little uh, abstract, if you will. Uh, what I wanted to do is just put a couple of real world examples. So I'll give everyone a chance just to have a look at the Dilbert. Uh, that's, that's one of my favorites. And that's, all of this is wonderful, you know, building out this, this large infrastructure, but if the underlying technology, there's a flaw and there's determinism and predictability within random numbers, then you're building a house of cards. Uh, the classic example of this is out of Switzerland, a company called Crypto AG, uh, that ran for decades. They, they sold a lot in the Middle East and Africa and come to find out that although they had quite a good infrastructure about doing crypto, um, the actual random numbers were not as random as you would have liked. And it meant that the whole scheme was flawed. So our focus in, on the underpinning zero trust is that layer of delivering verifiable and tamper-proof random numbers. So they're not these predictable sequences. How does this all fit together? With better random numbers, you end up with stronger keys, and then those stronger keys can underpin you know, traditional algorithms, things like RSA you see in web browsers, AES you see a lot around the federal government, things like elliptical curve. 
And a little out of scope for this, this short talk uh, also supports the new algorithms from, from NEST. So within Zero Trust, technically this is the, the pillars of uh, network security and data security, but ultimately we're doing this in order to protect users, protect devices and protect networks. And as has come up on these fantastic previous calls, uh, we saw some new presidential directives uh, last week. Uh, there's a new national security memo eight and an earlier memo that just talks about zero trust. So th these things are very much in, in focus. So let, let me kind of bring it in a little bit. So we're arguing cryptographic keys, are the foundation of you know, the stack of security in general. And there's three aspects to that. There's algorithms, which we've talked about. So we're agnostic to algorithms, whether classical or post-quantum. There's key management where you'll see, you know, vendors, people like uh, SafeNet and, and Trust and others, uh, very, very strong in management. And of course, there are many schemes uh, around things like key distribution, uh, people manipulating keys in various ways to do obfuscation. Again, we're agnostic to that. So if you think of what we're doing, this is really defense in depth, and we're focusing in key generation. Uh, I'll talk about how it fits into the big picture and then kind of duck back in, into, the, in, in, into the details. So the idea is it's not sufficient to kind of have that better mousetrap and argue that, oh, we do this wonderful thing. How do you integrate it? So we, you know, the teams work really, really hard to make it available as a software as a service platform. So just you know, you know, pick your favorite uh, cloud vendor. Uh, we have a hybrid solution, which is kind of partially on-site, partially off-site, and completely on-site. So these hardened keys, the benefit of these hardened keys feeds directly into encryption, into IoT systems, blockchain, watermarking, PKI, and so on. Um, Again, I'm, I'm going through this at a very kind of high level just to give you a, a flavor of it. Uh, where are some of the places we've done this? I mentioned folks who are doing uh, things like key management. We've worked with Talos and their HSMs. Uh, we've worked with uh, folks doing PKI infrastructure. Uh, some of the more famous ones, and these are all just the public references, things like securing the comms to the space station, and just last week, we deployed uh, with a company called Pure VPN, where we were able to kind of bolt on these capabilities. And I think they have something like 3 million endpoints. So just to kind of summarize, what are we trying to do? Um, true randomness coming from a verifiable quantum source, uh, strong uh, emphasis on device independence, and also making it kind of very easy to do. So that's, that's kind of the, the high level of how are we taking, you know, some of the work from the many PhDs, um, make it in something valuable for an organization and, you know, also make it easy to implement. So into the details, uh, Alison, I think you, you asked about this. Uh, the keys, what, what's, what's, what are the characteristics of a good key? Should be private. We're not, we're not sharing this, we're not, sh you know, showing this around. And it should be unpredictable. Uh, obviously, the problem we're trying to address, uh, there have been some papers. This is one of the, the recent ones, 2019. You know, as many as one in a couple of hundred of keys that are just out there. Think about people generating, you know, they're in a data center full of Ubuntu or Windows or Red Hat. The entropy that's available, the randomness just isn't sufficient. And it, it's leading to the potential for predictability. Uh, just surveying a little bit the industry, uh, what do you see? Well, von Neumann had mentioned that there's no such thing as a true random number. It's really about an algorithm. So when you think about software and you're just running like a rand function, what you get back, especially if you call it just the once, you might be getting a very, very weak seed. Uh, folks doing things like HSMs, folks are doing this in hardware, you kind of get better results. And we're obviously not the first big people to have done um, quantum random number generation. What we're trying to do is, you know, verification and tamper proof, like what is the best possible version at this day of that? So one of the things we, we looked at, and this is a, an independent scientific paper, 
It's looking at one of the earlier versions uh, of quantum random numbers uh, generation. And what we saw is early on, uh, there was a lot of promise, but uh, as new surveys, new, new test results have come in, it wasn't as random as was predicted. And some of this is really just the physics of it. You know, what are the characteristics of the mirror, the laser beam, the temperature pressure, all, all these kinds of factors that in some senses, it was a little bit like the early, you know, the early mainframe computers. Um, when I came up as a small child, you, you had to write everything in, in assembler to, to write eight bit games. It, there was a lot of dependency on hardware. So our PhDs were looking at, well, how do you get this benefit of quantum randomness with the least dependency on the device possible? So obviously the far right hand side where there's no dependency at all would be the ideal. Uh, come to find out we, we could get quite there, but we could get extremely close. So um, with this first uh, quantum cybersecurity product, the only assumption we have is really the trust of the company itself in the we're not malicious and we're sidestepping many of the kind of hardware dependencies that previously were there. So um, again, these are, you know, I'm flying over these at a, a high level. These are, you know, open to inspection. We have patents and, and, and so on in this area. Uh, this is a, co a comparison with the hardware, a, a so-called TRNG or a true random number generator just to explain it, I know this is a little bit of an eye chart, uh, but on the right-hand side, you could interpret this with the kind of best of just classical random numbers that you would see, say in, in a, a government organization or, or a bank, an international bank. Um, every 10 bits you're getting that you're expecting to be random. If I look at this for the entropy, actually five of them are bad. What Quantum Origin has worked to, to deliver as this, this kind of first use case is that it's as close to one as it can be. It's, it's not absolutely one, but it's extremely close. There's, there's a number there, I think it's two to the minus 128. So it's just extremely close. And so the innovation here is not that we're the first people to come up with a quantum random number generator. No, the, the people who've done this before, I, I would say it, it's more the business process and how it's being packaged that we begin with a similar um, you know, laser system, et cetera. And we verify that the phenomena that we're measuring are truly quantum, that they're truly random. So we go through a bell test, which says, is this random? Are, are we beginning with a quantum process to kind of avoid this you know, this idea of you got a whole bunch of, of data coming in, but you're not really sure whether it is verifying it. And then we, we have this thing called a randomness extractor. And from an architectural point, not necessarily from a, a physics point, but kind of a real world point, what we typically do is look at an organization and what are you already doing? What's your existing source of randomness? What's your existing uh, process? And we combine the two. And that's interesting because then what you end up with is, is a hybrid approach where it's the classical randomness, whatever was previously there that was previously approved and everyone's familiar with, plus quantum. And in a sense there, you have a fail safe. If the classical were to be cracked, then you still have the quantum. If for some reason there was a flaw in the quantum and that were to be cracked, you still have the other. So kind of a nice idea of en encapsulation. Um, Flying through these, I, 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 I know. Uh, and I'll take some questions at the end. I'm just trying to move this. And um, I think we agree 15, 20 minutes. So how do you deploy that? You know, I'm a CISO, I'm an architect, I'm a CTO. How would you do that? So again, some of the innovation is a very standard API that you can consume keys via, via the cloud. Um, we're working on an on-premise version, which for some customers, they just want custody of everything. So that, that will be an option. But what I think is interesting is an embedded option where the entropy, the source of entropy coming from the US is consumed by the organization. And then the organization itself 
generates keys. So they have a chain of custody on, on the keys and the handling. That, that will be typical with something like, um, like an HSM. So just to kind of wrap this up, and I know I've covered a lot of ground, um, we're not trying to solve everything. You know, for example, in algorithms, the, you could if if the output here the desire was a twenty forty eight bit RSA key, then that's the output. If it were AES two fifty six, then that's the output. Were and I, we're very respectfully waiting on the conclusions from uh, NIST. Were that say Saber or one of the other other uh, alternatives, then that would be that would be the output. So working again, um, an idea of a kind of hybrid, working with the, either the classical or the, the post-quantum or potentially both uh, fitting in within that. So really what I hope that I've shown is how we're taking today's um, you know, quantum technology and extracting from that something that's truly useful and fitting it in with something like, um, you know, the zero trust architecture. And I would say within the zero trust architecture, if I go back five, 10 years, a lot of this was done, uh, used to be called the IDAM, Identity and Access Management. And people would set up uh, systems where, you know, they do a good job in the starting state, but the component that was missing was this kind of idea of verifying and checking, you know, this person that connected to me, yes, that's Simon, but did we see Simon, you know, this minute Simon was in New York, but a minute later, suddenly he's showing up in LA. There's something anomalous there. What we've done is packaged up that, that quantum technology. And we've also added this idea of it being verifiable and kind of implicitly anti-tamper. So anti-tamper is like a little hark back to that, um, you know, the, the crypto AG company that I mentioned where everything appeared wonderful, but either something had broken or something wasn't operating right or worse had been tampered with. And kind of reflecting the philosophy of Cambridge, Cambridge kind of looks at, um, there's obviously huge research going around the world. We're not saying that, all the wins, all the ideas are going to come from us. We think it's going to be much wider than that. Actually, we think there might be, um, you know, specific machines, even for specific classes of problems. So we, we're trying to be a little bit more, um, well, trying to be agnostic and not write things in a way, uh, something I saw at the beginning of my career where, you know, some people would do big Endian, other people would do little Endian, where there's an unnecessary hard coding down into the code and to be uh, flexible in getting to that. So I flung through those slides in I think about 15, 15 minutes. So um, hopefully you guys were able to take that in and I'm very open to answering questions. Thank you so much, Simon. I appreciate it. And I did like the deep dive um, and, and did follow along. I'll open it up for folks um, on the call. Are there any questions for Simon? If not, I'll be the first one to ask. So uh, you mentioned in the beginning the, um, the quantum EO that was just released at the White House and the different government agencies now have to migrate um, over to something. And, and some of those timelines in the executive order were um, quite quick, you know, within 90 days or within 120 days. Um, given the work that you guys are doing in this space, you know, from a, a CISO's perspective, from an agency, and I know you came from the agency, is how long is it going to take to migrate over to these type of post-quantum or how, how long would it be to, to work with you all? I, I'd love to know some timelines and stuff. Oh, oh um, okay. Um, from our perspective, from Cambridge's perspective, we could go from today, let, let's say three, four weeks, and you would have, or an agency would have a working POC or a pilot for you know, some reasonable um, number of people, um, let's say a thousand people. So from our side, we can go quite quickly. I think 
you know, from an, an organization side, you, you've you got, you know, they've got to get the authorizations, you've got to get the funding, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a number of bureaucratic steps. Um, you certainly no one's going to convert the whole organization overnight or in the next, you know, 30 mm-hmm. days. That's not unre- that's not reasonable. But we, we are able to show how this is, is achievable in a very small time frame. And we're getting the staff trained up and, you know, you know, different aspects of it. It's, it's getting input for policy. You know, so, you know, in terms of POCs and pilots, one of the, uh, one of the slides I had in here uh, emphasized, uh, you know, ease of, of integration. Um, you know, you know, from a physicist's point of view, classically, yeah, it'd be great if you saw, you know, we sold a million dollar computer and the forklift backs it into the, in, in, into the company with the reinforced floor, but it's not necessarily practical. So, uh, you know, a lot of thought, I'm, I'm showing the wrong slide here, a, a lot of thought went into how do you make it easy to consume? Uh, I'll give you an example. I used to be at Red Hat and, you know, Red Hat was a great story of Linux and today everyone's kind of on board with it. But it used to be a swine to use Linux. It used to be everything was at the command line. You probably had to come out of MIT, Carnegie Mellon. Everyone had to be a PhD. And to the extent that they made it just very easy to solve standard problems and you had a wizard and you could run it on Intel, you could run it on AMD, it would run on Dell, it would run on HP, it would talk to Oracle. That's kind of what we're doing. It's, you know, yes, it's the physics, but it's also how, how do you consume it? Yeah, this is uh, Bob Mariner. I have a question for you. How, how are you offering your as a service model? How, how is that uh, practically being consumed by agencies or private sector right now? Um, agencies are newer. Um, the public private sector I have on here, it, it's, it's actually increased quite a lot, but we, we, we have NDAs. So it, it's just SaaS. Uh, you know, if, if you're asking about standards, it's more uh, PKCS 11, I think, is the, the typical point of interface. So a lot of this is, you know, just fitting in with what people have. I'll, I'll, I'll just throw some out randomly. I'm not saying that these, but uh, things like OpenVPN, things like TLS, uh, right. a, a lot of emphasis on, you know, sometimes the more you try and increase the scope, you can, you know, if you think about the old vocabulary of client and server, if I change the server, then I got to change the client. And if there's millions, you end up with a, a big problem. A, a, a lot of what we tried to do is get the benefit of this hardening and be able to roll it out with existing. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, it's, it's a strength or a, a weakness, depending on how you look at it. So certainly in terms of keys, we think it's strong, but it, it, in order to do this sufficiently, you know, you, as an organization, you'd likely want to look at management and you'd want to look at algorithms as well. So right. you know, we're a piece of, you know, like, like the little CND kind of diagram we had earlier, that we're a piece of that. Yeah. You know, your, your presentation is very refreshing because, you know, another one of our ATARC members on his group is, Representatives from Quintessence Labs, they have the similar product, uh, not quite the same, but you know, uh, as far as your emphasis on zero trust and how important it is to have these kind of key mechanisms known to customers that are right now commercially available, like you're saying, it goes a long way. So this is a very educational aspect of what you presented today. Uh, it really is a big deal as far as hardening zero trust around the data pillar, especially. Right. Well, 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 thank you. And that, that's that's something we're trying to do with the government. And it's also one of the reasons we're in um, right. part of ATOC. Like I, I've been on the other calls and, you know, right. I, I, I'm learning and we, we're growing the we, we're growing the, the ecosystem. But, you know, I, I've seen this before where somebody says, oh, yeah, I want to do network security. And, you know, you start looking at their network diagram and diagram and every kind of node on the chart, they're like, well, you, you need to have another node. And I'm thinking, hang on, I've got a thousand nodes. So I need to buy a thousand devices. And then I need to sort of, you know, it, it's achievable, but your go to market there starts to go into years. Thank you so much, Simon. Are there, is there another question? Yeah, uh, Simon, 
uh, Marvin Woodson with the FAA. Have you been in contact with our uh, Zero Trust Working Group? Has anyone uh, there talked to you, had any discussions with them? I'm in Zero Trust Working Group, but I, I haven't talked to the, the FAA. So I, I've talked to a few people over there, uh, folks like CISA, who you know like, liked the approach and liked that we were trying to fit in with what they were asking rather than do something different. But no, I, I'd, I'd be very happy to follow up with them. It, you know, as a pilot myself, I, I, I really want that system to be secure. Okay. Uh, if you could put your contact in the chat or just have it forwarded uh, to me that uh, Marvin Woods, Marvin.woods at FAA.gov. And I'll get it to, um, I'll get that to our um, Zero Trust Working Group. Uh, absolutely, Marvin. I'd be happy to follow follow up on that. Okay, thanks. We have about two minutes left. Um, I, first of all, I want to thank Simon again for the insightful conversation today. Um, we are really excited um, to have you as part of our speaker series. And again, uh, we are trying to broaden the speaker series out. So um, if you have other folks inside of your networks that you think will be able to share um, some insight into work they're doing as it relates to quantum, um, we will be really excited uh, to have them come. We are excited to have Barbara Goldstein who's coming up um, for a future one. She's gonna talk about quantum technology readiness. Um, and that one's actually gonna be a little bit longer. We're gonna have a 45 minute discussion uh, and then we also have GE Research talking about how they're using quantum in a variety of aspects, both from en uh, energy as well as asset management. Um, and we're very excited to hear, um, unfortunately, Lily is not with us today, uh, when NIST is actually able to announce and make their announcement on their post-quantum cryptography. I'm excited to have her come and her group come to talk a little bit more. And I'm sure Simon will be uh, right there as well. Um, but again, thank you everybody for participating again. Thank you, Simon uh, from Cambridge Quantum. We really appreciate your time today. Uh, and thank you, great questions. And you really appreciate the group. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna invite everyone to this. I think, I think this is very helpful. Yes, thank you. Good job. Please, please do. Thanks everybody. Have a great